Telf, thank you so much for joining us. The BTE again, as I said, with JK's World of Golf. And, mate, let's kick it off with the golf because if you won't let our players play the majors, Greg Norman's come out and said, we're going to create our own majors then. I mean, for God's sake, mate. Does anyone care apart from them? No, no one. No one. I'd, I'd, I'd say they'd be very lucky if they got uh, 48 viewers worldwide to watch it, actually. But, yeah. Um, uh, it, it has indicated, unfortunately, I suppose, from Liv's point of view, um, this real issue that has arisen, which I don't think any of them saw this at all when all of this money was being tossed around and the tens and hundreds of millions of it. Um, the key in golf are the world golf rankings. It's the same, I, I guess, in, uh, in tennis. But in, in golf, they're everything. And Ryan Fox is a very good example of how they work. Um, if you play well enough, and you don't have to be this overnight sensation, but you just work on your results, get a little better, see your ranking up. As soon as you're inside the top 50 in the world, like Ryan is now, bingo. Uh, it's the rich get richer scenario. He's now into all of the four majors next year because he's ranked 23 in the world. But the way the system works is that every week... The points that you earned on that week 12 months ago are dropped. Yeah. So if you win a tournament 12 months ago and you get 500 points, which is the standard for winning a golf tournament on a major tour, um, you go up. But you lose them as well the following year. And so all these guys who went to live, and some ah, of them, like uh, Cameron right. Smith, ran, ranked as high as number two in the world. Now, poor old Dustin Johnson, he's done nothing for uh, even before he went across to live. So his ranking now is down to something like 100. And even Rory McIlroy has found enough kind of contrition in his soul to say that, well, that's wrong. You know, he's not the 100th best golfer in the world. He should be a lot higher than that. But it's an indication of the desperation that these guys are facing. They, they want to have their cake and eat it. Yep. Fair enough. They want to yep. take the big money and they want to play in the majors. Uh, but the official world golf rankings have just said, no, you don't, you don't even come close to meet, meeting the requirements. First of all, you've got to have a full field of somewhere at least around about 100 golfers, so 140 in your field, which they don't. You've got to have a four-round tournament, which they don't. They only play three rounds and live golf. And so there's these very basic problems that are stopping them from even considering whether they will give them uh, world ranking points. And meanwhile, every week, the rankings are going down. And I think um, uh, one of the top guys, it's Kepka or someone now, is about 33rd in the world. And so... Uh, by the time the next major comes around, a lot of these guys would have slipped out of the top 50 and can't play in them anyway. So, so how does it? So um, we've that, got a court case happening in America, okay? But that could be delayed. That could take forever. You know what lawyers are like. I mean, they're going to do what no, lawyers... No, that, that'll be... Uh, it's been, the stay has been put on this court case uh, until January of next year. And I, I'm assuming that one of the reasons they're holding it in January, once the kind of year kicks into place, so they can deal with this issue and any subsequent appeals and resolve it before the Masters starts right. okay. first week. Yeah. Mm. Can, could the Masters, if they wanted to, Brendan, because they're so independent, BTE, Brendan Telford, experience with us, could the Masters turn around and invite these live golf players? Because they operate absolutely. completely... Absolutely. They're right. Okay. Absol absolutely. In fact, most of the uh, majors could do that. I mean, the, the Masters is a world to its own. But they don't have anything like 144 or 156 starters in the field. It's a private company. It's a private golf course. It's been going since 1935. This event is just called the Masters, and they decide who goes into the, fi into right. the field. But in recent years, they have conformed to the top 50 role, but they also have these weird sort of exemptions, like if you've won in the past, even if you're 83, you can still play at it next year. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, right. Arnold Palmer turned up so, every year. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so they have this particular rule, and no one will argue with Augusta because it's the most prestigious golf tournament in the world, even probably, you might argue, ahead of the British Open. And so, But the Open Championship, by its very nature, the, the, head, the guy that runs the British Open is saying, look, our very title, the Open Championship, means we are open to everyone. Right. And so they are humming and harring about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to stick to their guns and not let anyone who's qualified play.
So it's a it can only be resolved uh, in a court. That's no. the only place. Mm-hmm. There's no no common ground between. The no, two they're not. No, they're not. But honestly, um, this is like it, so, what is it? This is like War of the Roses. You know, this is um, Kathleen Turner and yeah, Michael is, Douglas. So, isn't it? I mean, they're never yeah. ever going to. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about uh, Julian. Uh, Sav- uh, sorry, Adi Savir's sabbatical. This has been a big topic for the last couple of days, mate. You know, and I, if I can pretend to be the CEO of New Zealand Rugby for a second, my 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 approach to this would be: look, congratulations, well done. I wish you all the very best. Next. And that would be it. I think this is ridiculous how the tail now wags the dog. I, look, having said that, I applaud Adi Savia. Anyone that can negotiate a clause like that in their contract, excellent. But the deal is, is that New Zealand domestic rugby is falling off a cliff here, and these and these competitions need our best players playing. How has New Zealand rugby got itself into a state where these guys can decide whether or not they actually want to play in New Zealand, and then they come back and decide whether or not they want to play? I mean, how how's that happen? Well, it's happened because of what happened with Ben Carter all those years ago, and it's power, it's player power, and I think we you can criticise it and jump up and down and say it's, and get all moralistic about it, but it's realistic. I suppose this is the point. Um, if we want to keep guys like uh, Savier in the fold, and he's still got something to contribute, I imagine that ideally, I'm sure Foster would love to have him, wants to have him at the next uh, Rugby World Cup. But that, but that goes but without I'm, saying, I'm, Brendan. I'm, he I'm, is because because this happens after guys. that. Sorry. Yeah. This, you know, they've they, got to accommodate these guys. Well, why do they have to accommodate them? I mean, in, you know, is there any player in New Zealand who is so much bigger than the game and so more valuable to the All Blacks that we can't replace them? I mean, in two years' time, how do you know how good Artie Savier is with the toll that had taken on his body in all the test matches he's going to play in between? Well, I think the answer is have a look at the standard of rugby in the National Provincial Championship at the moment. Um, and uh, the floodgates would open if we didn't have some of these restrictions in place. I mean, I can't believe the standard of rugby. The NPC all this nonsense a few years ago, although well, I was probably correct at the time, it was the best provincial rugby championship in the world. Now, some of the rugby I've seen in the last couple of weeks um, uh, would barely do credit to club rugby because there's no stars playing in the NPC and if you don't have your top players the immediate effect of that is that the standard of rugby drops yeah well but this is what New Zealand rugby this is what it's facing but if they're not going to play NPC because the All Blacks don't and and no one gets selected from NPC to the All Blacks anymore Ian Foster said that so if you don't play super rugby I mean you can't keep asking people to go along and pay their money when the best players aren't there and the example I've I've used Brendan is you'd never see it early in Harland wouldn't get a break for four months from Man City to to exit the Champions League group stage and go and play in the Saudi League and then come back that wouldn't happen and also New Zealand rugby wouldn't let any of their other employees they wouldn't let Mark Robinson the CEO go and cash up in Japan for four months and come back and keep his job so why do they do it with the players? Yeah but what you're forgetting about in the case of football players is that there is enough money internally in the sport for these guys not to have to go offshore. What about what happens in countries like Brazil and Argentina? What happens to their best players? Where do they go? They go offshore. They sure. go to Europe. That's it. Yeah. They go to, yeah. And, but they and, just and, replace them in the and teams so, and the crowd's still coming along. They don't actually seem to mind. I mean, these guys earn a fortune yeah, playing for the All Blacks anyway, mate. Yeah, but they, 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 those Brazilian stars and Argentinian stars and others from South America who go off and play in Europe and all these different competitions are still eligible to play for their country. But you, we have a rule in New Zealand that you can't play for the Yeah, that's stupid. You can't have it both ways. But in the end, uh, I remember John Hunt telling me this years and years ago that this was never sustainable, this idea of actually locking up our leading players and not allowing them to play offshore in some shape or form. But either that, um, live with the system at the moment, which does great, or open the floodgates and let them all go. Yeah, but the, the, well, I think, I think that, you know, Club rugby in England is collapsing. Every single club is in financial distress at the moment and Wasps have just gone into liquidation or, yeah. or uh, receivership. There's not that many places available. And the thing is, once you leave our shores and go somewhere else, Brendan, you become an ex-All Black at that stage and your value dips and drops from the moment that you leave the country. Two years from now, you are an old All Black. And with Artie Savera, as brilliant as he is, he hasn't won a World Cup for us. If he doesn't win a World Cup next year, he's just going to be another player who is a good player. He's not going to be a legendary player. But again, I applaud it. Let's move on to 1960. Because we were talking about this yesterday, the anniversary of both Bob Beeman and Tommy Smith and John Carlos. And you talked to Tommy Smith. There was an extraordinary moment in world sport, that Black Power salute. Well, it, it was, and it still is, and it still retains its prominence um, for reasons that probably don't have much to do with athletics. I mean, at the time in 1968, um, it was an extraordinary gesture, and that these two men knew what they were doing. 
and became the most hated men in America. Amazing. They were haunted um, by the head of the IOC, this uh, um, white supremacist, a guy called Avery Brundage, who did a deal with Hitler back in the 1930s to get the Berlin Olympics in Germany. And he was still running uh, the Olympic Games in 1960. Was he before Samaraj? He sport. was Sam before, yeah, because he was just oh, as evil. yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he ran the Olympic Games from the 1930s up until the 1970s. Wow. Um, and he had enormous power, so he haunted and harassed these two guys. And it's, it strikes me as extraordinary when I think about it, how the dark ages of American race relations back in the 1960s, that these two men, simply by making a gesture um, for racial equality and against poverty, uh, was so maligned and so hated and heaped with vitriol in 1968, yet within 40 years... America had elected a black president yeah. in the form of Barack Obama. Yeah. So one of the reasons why that gesture of those two, and we shouldn't forget Peter Norman, the Australian, who supported them fully and had a badge on the little shirt that he was wearing on the victory day, uh, supporting their project against uh, poverty. Um, one of the reasons why it has stood so prominently for 50 years is because I think the legacy of those two men will be that the tremendous progress uh, that black professional sport has made in America can be traced back to the defiant stand of those two uh, in front of the world audience in Mexico City in 1968. They were treated as demigods and still are, revered rather like uh, Muhammad Ali amongst the black community of America for what they did. And um, you look at the leading sports in America now, dominated by mm, black, black athletes, Americans, yeah. male and females. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and what people don't kind of, a lot of people don't actually... Know or connect is that there was a there was a, um, a political movement called the Black Panther Party. That's what they were in support of because the Black Panther Party was about you know kids, schools, food and homes as much as walking around with rifles and that and actually challenging police brutality and things. And also 1968, mate, go back to it. I mean that was when Martin Luther King got assassinated, right? That was before the Olympic Games. Yeah. Bobby Bob Bobby Bobby Kennedy got assassinated. So remarkable. And also Bob Beeman. I mean, we were, look, we were looking at the footage of this, mate. They didn't have a tape measure long enough, Brendan, to measure his long jump. Isn't that out of it? Crazy, eh? Yeah, it's amazing. amazing. That's why I can still remember that distance embedded in my mind. Um, 8.90 metres, and yep. I can tell you... 29 and a half feet. A really, really, yeah, 29 feet, two and a half inches, Mark. There you go. Don't forget the two, two and, and, and a half, half inches. inches. Yep. And um, the remarkable thing about that is, uh, in 54 years, the world record and the men's long jump has only been broken once, and that was by another black American, Mike Powell, in 1991, and it is still the world record today. Wow. He went out to 8, eight metres 95, and, I mean, it must be noted in the case of Beeman anyway that um, in 1968 when the Olympic Games were held at Mexico City, it was about three, 4,000 feet or metres above sea level. And um, what happens in that thin air, it's fantastic for sprints. I mean, uh, Tommy Smith, who won the gold medal in that 200 metres, the controversial race with the salute that he did, he broke the world record. Um, and ever since then, since 1968, there's been two classes of world records for sprinting. I won it... Um lower altitude and one at higher altitude. Um, it was a uh, hopeless if you're running distance at altitude because you ran out of breath. Yeah, your lungs would burn up. Mm. If, it was an, if it was an aerobic exercise, only once around the track or 100 metres, you could absolutely fly. And so that's why those guys were able to run so fast. And Beeman, of course, uh, generated enormous speed down the runway and went out to 8 metres 90. And um, uh, it was an amazing performance. And only betted once since, since then. Okay, trivia question for you. New Zealand won a gold medal. What in? <laughs> 1968, it was rowing. Yeah, first ever rowing medal. Uh, maybe. It was a man it was the men's fours. Coxed four. You're exactly right. We're going to play some highlights Cox on that in a second. Fours. It is the BTE with yeah, uh, JK. Tell, tell you who was in that crew was um, Dudley Story. Okay. Well, 90, 1968. Yeah. We'll go back to that in a second. The BTE, courtesy of JK's World of Golf 24-7 and a box of balls. Bang yourself stupid at the airport. All right, we're going to finish with the Women's Rugby World Cup. You've got some thoughts about this tournament compared yeah, to the men's. Just, just, yeah, just some, just some random thoughts here. Um, I'd have to say I'm really disappointed um, that there is no real extensive free-to-air coverage 
of this Rugby World Cup. You will remember in 2011, every man and his dog who had a production company yep. was getting, had live coverage. Marty TV, TV, TV3, I was actually running TV1's coverage, and Sky had it, four TV different one, ones. Right? TV3, yeah. Sky, yeah, yeah, that was live coverage. Now, along comes the Women's Rugby World Cup, and I've just gone back to have a look at the launch at um, Parliament um, a year or so ago, and Jacinda Ardern, uh, as you would imagine, uh, pushes strongly the cause for women right across the board. And she was making these huge statements about how significant this event was. Um, its reach was going to be global, and it was not just an important and historic occasion for uh, women's rugby, but for women's sport internationally. And she's got her deputy prime minister, who is the minister of sport. She's a strong advocate for women's sport. And um, world rugby, I presume, also is in that same boat. And yet here in New Zealand, compared to the men, this is a really poor deal we've got. Um, uh, the couple of matches, I think, at the start were live, and I think we'll see some matches towards the end. Delayed, live, but delayed, be, Brendan. Uh, they delay- were delayed coverage, OK? We, they were delayed. Free to air is delayed, think, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I think uh, the last few matches, including the final, are live on free to wear TV. But compared to the deal that uh, we got from the men's rugby world cup when we hosted it in 2011, the women, I think, have been ripped off. Yeah, here. totally agree. And mate. they they need and they need the coverage more than the men. Of course, everyone worldwide who's interested in rugby will watch the Men's Rugby World Cup because it's such a well. As Steve Chu said it's the third biggest sporting event in the world. Right, the third biggest. Uh, but. But but uh, women's rugby, which is on a growth path for sure, what a pity that in this country here, and here's Jacinda Ardern wanting young girls to be inspired by these um, heroes, these heroines, and they can't watch it unless they've paid to see it um, uh, live. But um, So I've, I've been watching it in delay, actually, and um, uh, it's just a pity. But And also, my second thought, as far as the rugby goes, um, yes, Wayne Smith was very pleased with that performance last week, and they've not run up close to 100 points in two matches. But the tone of some of his comments last week told me after that match against Wales that he's a worried oh, man. Oh, he is. And he made, a, he made a point at one stage there when he talked about the unforced errors dropping the ball, forward passes, aimless kicks. And he said, we are a long way behind England at the moment. And uh, yet, uh, we're only a couple of games away from beating them. Yeah, that's, I mean, look, and if, if, they're, good, if, they, if they're good enough. Well, also, the, you know, the, the fact that Wales scored a couple of driving malls against us. I mean, that Pommy side, you yes, look at them, mate. I mean, they play, yes, they yes. play like the old England rugby side, the 80s, 90s, Martin yeah, Johnson's yeah. like that. They only need 10 players on the field, mate, because that forward pack keeps the ball, doesn't let you get the ball, and they, and they just grind you down. Uh, uh, I've been trying to work out this afternoon, and maybe I'm just not literate enough on my computer or my computer skills. Who do you think are likely to play in the quarter final? Do you think I can find it oh, anywhere? Mate, I'll tell you honestly. Break? Yeah, no, we've gone through this ourselves, mate. You have to take a couple of Panadol and lie down afterwards. It's just you yeah. need an algorithm uh, and a degree in applied um, mathematics. Don't worry about I, it, mate. I mean, it's compounded by the fact that you only have 12 teams in this competition, mm. three groups. So you, you haven't got. Um, it's, how do you get eight quarterfinals from three groups? So I presume I think it's three, three, and two. Uh, or, no, I think it's I think it's two, two, two and two, 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 and the two, next two, best place two. third teams is how it yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. we don't know who. So it could be they could beat France actually in the quarterfinals because France are probably going to finish second in their group, aren't they? Because they were beaten by England last yep. week. And so we will play a team that finishes second, I imagine, in one of those other groups. If you win your group, in theory, you get an easier quarterfinal opponent. That's the oh, I, I tell you, I'd, I would even, I would say that if you win your group, there's every chance you get the, one of the best third-place sides. I say, I mean, as you say, mate, I mean, just, just yeah, chill out, yeah. wait till it happens, and we'll find out at the time. Brendan, thank you so much. The BTE, the Brendan Telfer Experience.